Anyway, thanks everyone for coming. Welcome to the TIPS Annual Forum. Um, welcome to the Minister, Minister Rob Davies. Thank you for coming. Um, thank you to Channing from UNU WADA and to Imran Velodia um, from WITS. Um, and thank you to all our speakers, panelists, discussants, rapporteurs, and delegates. Thank you all for joining us um, for an exciting uh, two-day conference. We've got people from um, across academia, government, research institutes, there's some private sector people, there's some people from SOEs, embassies, civil society. Um, so we've got um, a lot of different people represented at this forum. And there's also people from a, um, academics from a multitude of universities from across South Africa um, and also from other African countries. We've included colleagues um, from Zambia and Zimbabwe and um, Malawi and one or two other places. So um, we, we've got a great representation and, looks for, and I'm looking forward to some really interesting and exciting discussion. Um, we also have a few academics from international universities um, from um, overseas, and welcome to South Africa. Um, for those of you who don't know me, and I think most probably do, um, my name's Saul Levine. I'm the executive director of TIPS and um, program director for the conference. Um, I just wanted to thank our sponsors for the TIPS Forum. Um, they are UNU WADA, um, who um, is represented by Channing, and we've got the USAID um, Southern African Trade, Trade Hub, and Katie is somewhere in the audience. Um, thanks. Um, and the, I think their support is just, it's more than just funding that we get from them. It's also um, support that we get in terms of bringing people out to the conference and contributing um, speakers and discussants towards the program. So thank you very much for all your support. And I think it's without that kind of support that we wouldn't have been able to have this kind of conference um, and event. So thank you very much. Um, can I clap for them? <laughs> Thanks. Um, we're also gonna have um, you and you, WADA, assisting us with social media for the event. Um, so there are going to be people tweeting, and we've got a hashtag, tips forum. Um, so if you want to tweet, um, I'm not really someone who tweets, but um, <laughs> but um, for those that do, um, that that is the hashtag, and um, yeah. So they'll be tweeting some of the comments, and the sessions are filmed. So we we would have liked sort of a. Um, open discussion, but the, the forming and the tweeting sort of prevents um, sort of a Chatham House rules from applying. So um, what, what you do say may be recorded and may be tweeted, um, but um, I hope that doesn't prevent us from having some robust discussion. Um, and we, we, we don't have any media present, but we do have people who will capture some of the media. Um, so. Um, there will be articles, hopefully, in, the, in some of the newspapers reporting accurately on some of what transpires through the conference. Um, I also want to thank our partners from government um, who have given us huge support. So there's the team from DTR led by Garth um, and his colleagues who have joined us, and Landon from National Treasury, and um, Rudy from Department of um, Performance Monitoring and Evaluation, um, who um, have all supported this process and are our partners in this forum. Um, this forum is the 12th TIPS forum that's taking place um, since TIPS was started in 1996. So we have a long track record of running these forums. Um, the last one though was only was run in 2010, but we have held um, two economic conferences subsequent um, to that. And um, the, these kind of events are important because they allow a space for people to present their research, for policymakers to come and engage on some of the issues, and for us to have some nice open dialogue around um, some of the research that's been taking place. So the reason we um, decided to um, resuscitate the forum after a few years gap was to try and get that dialogue back and to try and have some of those discussions. And the, the support that we got from our sponsors has enabled us um, to go down that road. Um, we also, after last year's dialogue conference that we held with um, the, the EU and Economic Development Department and DTI, um, we saw great value in having these sessions and that, that was also a prompt for us to um, continue with these um, type of sessions. Um, next year, TIPS turns 20 
and um, all going well, we'll be having our tips forum in late May, um, so we'll, we'll send out more details of that. We, we also will have a few other functions, so there may be a party that we'll invite people to and a few other things, maybe a publication or two. Um, the theme for next year's conference still needs to be finalized, but we'll send out a call for paper in the, in the next couple of weeks. So those who are interested in um, coming back next year, um, look out for that call. Um, and then um, so some of the work that TIPS does, and it's an opportunity now, if I've got a captive audience, to plug TIPS a bit. Um, but we, we do monthly dialogue sessions um, around some fairly interesting um, research that we've done. So we've had some um, sessions in the last few weeks where we presented our work on the integrated resources plan, it's a research project that we did for NEDLAC, some work that we did on electricity pricing and economic development for the electricity war room, and some research into the distressed mining community of the platinum, communities of the platinum belt. Um, so we, we presented those in the last couple of weeks. We have them at the TIPS offices, and we usually have some quite interesting and robust discussion at those sessions. Um, and then we've also had um, sessions where we give feedback on the Manufacturing Circle Quarterly Bulletin, um, where um, we present the findings of the, the Manufacturing Circle's report. And we, we also had um, quite a nice discussion a couple of weeks ago on the bits, um, which was um, quite a robust discussion. Um, and then um, in the next couple of weeks, we will be doing a few more interesting activities. We, there's a book launch that will be partnering with you and you wider and UCT, and that's a book launch by Ravi Kanbur, and that will be on the 11th of August at half past five at the Sheraton. So um, we will send out a notice for those interested in attending that. And then in September, we're going to be hosting the um, um, a port program with the DTI, there'll be a whole lot of parallel sessions and evening events, um, and we'll send out some notices to let people know. Um, and then another conference of this nature on subnational economic development will take place in October, and that's partnering with the National Treasury um, GTAC team, the Government Technical Assistance Advisory Centre. Um, okay, turning to this year's um, forum and the theme of regional industrialization and re regional integration. Um, we selected this theme um, coming out of some research that we did for the DTI, and it was a partner where we had project with, um, sorry, project where we had partnered with the CRED team at um, University of Johannesburg, the CSID team at um, WITS, um, the, a team at um, University of Zambia, and a team at the African Institute of Agrarian Studies in Zimbabwe. And it was research that we did for the Department of Trade and Industry, and it was looking at regional value chains. And some of the key issues that came out of that research will be presented by several um, of the research team during the course of the forum. Um, but one of the most important issues that stood out for me was the significant opportunities for industrial development that exist across the region. And th there's strong market demand um, across the value chains that we researched with potential benefits um, across the countries that were researched. So it's, it's benefits um, across the value chain in different countries. And for me that stood out is something that we really needed to explore and why some of the opportunities were being lost um, and, and why countries were not um, get, getting the full benefit of um, the, those value chains that were in existence and being strengthened and created. Um, these issues therefore warrant more research and interrogation. And then when we issued the call for papers last year, we received an overwhelming response. Um, and that highlighted that a lot of people are doing research in this area, and that, that means the conference of this nature is important. Um, and it's important because it helps us to better understand the issues and gives us um, some understanding of what the dangers are and what the upsides are around regional integration and the, the need to accompany um, regional industrialization with that. The aim of this forum is therefore to deepen the understanding of regional industrialization. Um, some of the papers will look at the role of South Africa in that context, and then we'll start to explore some of the value chains that operate across the region, and then look at the linkages between regional industrialization and regional integration. Um, the context for the forum, um, we've seen significant growth prospects within Africa um, over the past decade or so, but there are challenges now with commodity prices. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure that's um, taking place, and it's been a strong driver of growth as well as some 
um, aspects of consumer demand, um, how that plays out in the coming few years um, is not clear with the commodity price. But despite that, we still see the forecasts for Africa are above 5% annual growth, which means that um, there is a lot of growth in markets and things taking place. Um, a, a second contextual issue is the linkage between productive industrial capacity, economic growth and levels of development, um, which is an important consideration, especially for SADC. Um, and as the region has very, very low levels of industrialization, um, how do we start getting those things um, right? The third contextual issue is really the understanding of industrial development in southern Africa um, requires that we look at the role of the lead economy and the opportunities um, for smaller economies um, in the region to even increase their exports to South Africa and to grow their pr productive capacity on the back of that. Um, South Africa has a lot to offer other countries in the region through its institutions, logistics and technical services um, and that can also support the growth of industries um, in neighboring countries, um, in particularly um, agro agro-processing and agriculture industries. Capitalizing on these opportunities may, however, require a rethink on South Africa um, and how it integrates um, region industrialization into its domestic industrial policy. And we look forward to the minister's input um, on, on the changing policy direction on that. And it's something that we've seen working closely with government, a shift in, in the view and in the approach that is being taken. Um, the value chain research that um, the team undertook um, that I spoke about earlier um, gives some very practical case studies of what's going on in some of these value chains. A fourth contextual issue is around minerals and agricultural value chains and I think both of those come through very strongly in the papers that will be presented. And then the last contextual issue for me, and it's probably not the only, um, these are probably not the only contextual issues, but the last one is the increasing push for regional market integration. That can result in positive outcomes, but there are downsides if we integrate without the, the necessary understanding and approach to industrialization. Um, the themes for the conference are outlined in the conference um, agenda, and I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, but just a few, few quick pointers on conference logistics. Um, there are 10 sessions in the conference, um, and then there's the opening and closing plenaries. Um, and these um, cover the themes that are in the program and they'll be take the form of the panel discussion um, by, by people who are presenting papers. There will be two parallel sessions throughout the conference. So there will be one hold, held here and one in the venue that's on the other side. Um, so you, you need to choose your um, session wi wisely. Um, unfortunately, we, we can't have people in two places at the same time. So um, you'll need to make, make some... Um, decisions there. Um, and then we do have rapporteurs who will be capturing the discussion um, and we'll do a short briefing note at the end of the forum um, to capture the outcomes. Um, your name tags also double as a USB stick. So the clippy part, um, if you pull it apart, is a USB stick and that has all the conference, or almost all the conference papers on that. Um, so um, there will also be the conference papers available on the TIPS website and on the conference website if you would like to um, look at that. Um, I'm looking forward to a great two days of discussion and, and going forward to continuing doing great research um, on, on these issues. And a key outcome of the conference for me will be to develop a, further, a greater um, level of research um, and what our research agenda should be. And um, that will then inform our, conference, uh, sorry, our research agenda over the next couple of years on regional industrialization. Before handing over to, um, I think, is it Channing or Imran, um, to say a few words of welcome from Bits, um, I just want to thank the TIPS team who have been assisting with all the logistics of the conference. Um, they are probably outside, um, but they've done a great job in making sure that everything is organized, everyone got here, um, and um, everything runs smoothly. So without those people, um, we don't have a great event. So thank you to them. And Imran. Um, so, um, uh, being 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 sort of part of the tips um, of the tips annual forum again, uh, uh, kind of leads me to make two uh, 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 
uh, kind of reflections. The first is a, is a personal one, and the second is, is, is about where we're going around industrial uh, 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 kind of research in South Africa. I'll start with the second one. I, th I, 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 I was part of the, of, of the first TIPS annual forum, and uh, for, for those of us who were there for the early, early years, I think it was by far the uh, uh, kind of place where uh, po uh, sort of policy m m m makers and researchers engaged on what were the most uh, kind of, at the time, the most critical economic issues in the country. Um, and I think we went through a transition when the TIPS uh, sort of, uh, sort of forum stopped away from a focus on uh, uh, kind of questions of industry, questions of firms, to a sort of focus on, on sort, of, sort of poverty issues and, and mainly questions of redistribution. And I think the relaunch of the, of, of the TIPS forum uh, kind of really, uh, for me, captures the fact that I think the, 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 uh, that, that, that the enormous amount of research on matters of firms, um, matters of industries, um, matters of new emerging industries in the IT sector, uh, 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 matters of sort, sort of competition and regulation um, have really sort of come to the fore in the last while. And it's really, really fantastic that the TIPS forums being, being launched once more. Um, and when Saul approached me about, about whether Vits would, would want to be involved in this, uh, my first response was, of course. Um, and I'm really pleased that, that, uh, that the, the, the sort of forums uh, s uh, s uh, s um, s starting again today and that it's starting at Wits University. So welcome to Wits University, to all of you. Uh, so the second transition issue is, is, a, is a sort of personal one. I, I, I made the choice about a year ago uh, to move from a research uh, kind of job to a university bureaucrat. And, and being the, the, the kind of person who has to do the bureaucrat's welcome at the TIPS forum really sort of captures for me the fact that I've, I've kind of made the, the, made the transition from... Uh, from uh, uh, from uh, kind of presenting papers at the TIPS forum, which I would much, much rather do, uh, to, 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 to making the bureaucrat speech at the start. But uh, one, one makes these choices in life, and, and, um, and I guess you have to live with it. So from, from, from uh, uh, WITS's side, side, welcome to all of you, and I hope you have a fantastic two days around what seem to be really, really interesting themes. Um, um, I want to especially welcome the minister. Um, I think one of the fascinating things about the minister uh, and his role in this is, 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 is that he's the ideal minister, I think, for us to, uh, for us to have in this field. Uh, because he, he, he's, he sort of combines so much of what the TIPS Forum is about. Uh, it's, 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 it's sort of both steep in kind of fundamental and robust research, and I think he has a, um, a, fantastic, uh, uh, a fantastic track record himself in that area. And it's also steeped in a, in a sort of policy engagement, which, which, which uh, uh, which, he which he's played quite an instrumental um, 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 role in. So a special welcome to you, um, 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 Minister. So I've, I've now sort of, sort of done the bureaucrat's job and I w wish you all of the best. And um, I'm going to do what all good, good sort of bureaucrats do is uh, do do is is make their short speech, uh, sit for a while, and then leave for another meeting. And I'm I'm I, I, I'd, I'd much rather stay, uh, 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 but I have to leave for something else. And I'm sure you'll understand. Just.
Good morning, and uh, thank you for, for coming, and thank you for having me here. Uh, I'd like to recognize Saul for, for pulling this together, as well as the Full Tips team. Um, uh, he's been the driving force behind this, uh, and, and I think it's great. I also recognize uh, WITS, uh, DTI, USAID, and the National Treasury co-sponsors. Worth indicating the National Treasury, uh, it's part of the reason that WIDER is here today. We're involved in a very productive and, and fascinating collaboration, and, and we're really pleased with it. I'd also like to recognize Minister Davies for taking his time uh, to come and, uh, and, and share with us his thoughts uh, this morning. Minister Davies, Rob Davies, is not to be confused with, with Rob Davies, our, our, our discussant, uh, who's, who's also here and deserves a recognition for his, his contributions to economics in South Africa for a long, long time. Um, when Saul Levine came and, and asked me to participate, uh, you know, if we would be willing to collaborate with him on this, I, I jumped at the opportunity. And, and the reason was, sort of like Imran, I remembered back to the, to the first TIPS forum that, that I attended, uh, which I can't remember the exact year, but it was around um, 1999. And I, I do remember very well that I thought the forum was, was great. Um, and I'm really pleased that TIPS is taking this step to, to reinitiate the forums and getting this, this going and, and wider, you and you wider, uh, is really um, pleased to, take, to be a part of this effort. And I think it's, it's useful to think back to the atmosphere of those early forums, and Saul has done that a little bit. But if you think it was 1999, uh, you had at that time a, a growing mass of economic data from South Africa that gave you an opportunity to uh, uh, study how the economy of post-apartheid South Africa was doing, and that was a, a, a huge element of the forum. Also at the time, there were broad visions of regional integration, and, and those were also uh, a topic of, of discussion uh, and, and, and continue to be. Those discussions were really influenced by recent performance. Well, what was going on at the time, of course? And at that time, the EU was viewed as a large and stable market for products from, from Africa. It was growing both internally and through the accretion of, of membership. And South Africa and other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa historically had big trade shares with the EU, and so this was a big part of, of the opportunities um, that, that, uh, that existed at the time. And I recall having arguments as late as 2007 that all of this discussion about regional integration was a useless distraction from the real talks, which should be with Europe, about uh, economic partnership, because this is where the growth opportunities actually lie. And times change, right? We're now into the eighth year where the EU has barely grown at all. And certainly, the EU is not expanding or adding new membership. It's a, it's a different world. At the same time, we've seen a growth renaissance in, in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, that, that nobody uh, predicted. Uh, I'll make a, a short plug for uh, a book with, that I edited with Andy McKay and, and Finn Tarp looking at growth and poverty in Sub-Saharan Africa that's going to come out uh, from Oxford University Press uh, shortly. Um, but uh, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a changed situation. And uh, perhaps the lesson is that you can't predict what's coming. You can't predict what's coming forward. If you had said in 2003, oh, you know, African economies are going to go 5 to 7% per year for another decade and a half, uh, you wouldn't have gotten very much uh, listening, but, but they did. And, uh, uh, and this renaissance and this point gives us good reason to focus on the region, uh, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, the economic weight overall is about double what it was in 1999. You have economies, one that I know well, uh, Mozambique, that is approximately coming up on four times as large as it was in 1999. Um, and at the same time, a great deal has happened in terms of regional integration. We have fomented links. There are more linkages. There is more trade. Things are happening uh, within the region. And, and this, is, this is a base. It's a broad base, it's rapidly growing, and there are linkages there. And as Saul was saying, there's a great opportunity to achieve growth and development objectives via regional integration. And I think arguably greater than, than before. 
Um, at the same time, the appetite for sort of broad-ranging discussions, abstract liberalization, uh, is, is perhaps less. For example, there isn't a lot of belief that the static customs union is going to become operationalized uh, in the next few years, for example. And I think this is why the focus of this conference is, is so important. Uh, and the, the focus is on regional value chains and other specific opportunities. And, and we're very happy to contribute as you and you wider to this kind of discussion. We see, and I think Saul was mentioning, big opportunities in lots of areas, energy, agriculture, services, on top of uh, traditional manufacturing and other items. And I think that serious ex uh, exploration of these opportunities represents a viable way forward. Um, and this is why we're so pleased to support this conference as you and you wider. And we think that your work and these discussions can be helping in realizing the development objectives for the region as a whole. So thank you. Minister, do you want to come through? Thanks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Saul, and uh, let me say good morning to a number of very familiar faces I see here, friends, colleagues that I've worked with before in various capacities, uh, and uh, also um, people I haven't had a chance to meet, but also who are scholars and workers uh, in this uh, particular important subject of uh, regional industrialization and regional integration. I want to start by congratulating uh, the TIPS Forum this year for selecting this theme um, because I think that this is a major, major challenge that we are confronting as a continent and as uh, a country. Uh, how do we promote regional industrialization through, among other things, developing regional value chains? And I think that not only is this a, a major challenge, but it's one where a research input uh, and a very well-crafted and rigorous research input at that is actually very, very necessary. So let me just uh, <clears throat> make a few points about the broad directions that we see as government and also as the continent as moving in terms of regional integration and regional industrialization. Why? Uh, what are the focuses and where are the um, institutional processes uh, that uh, are intending to give effect uh, to uh, this vision? <clears throat> so the first point I want to make is that if you listen to any number of African leaders uh, who speak and articulate the, the way they see the future of the African continent, having uh, improved its growth performance and all of that and having been identified as the next growth frontier, where do they see uh, this, uh, this process going? Any number of them will say that the continent has got to move up the value chain and has got to industrialize. That's what any number of them will tell you. Very good reasons for this. Those good reasons are, among other things, that the drivers of growth that took place in the previous uh, period are no longer present in the same way that they were before. What I mean by this, in many cases, growth was driven in the continent by something called the mineral commodity super cycle. And uh, the countries that are now the oil producers have been the last to join the rest of us in seeing that the bonanza and the rents that were available from the mineral commodity supercycle are not available uh, in the same way that they were before. And I think that we've also got to understand that this is not just a cyclical matter, that we can hang around and wait and hope that uh, the price of all these mineral commodities is going to bounce back up again because this is cyclical. This is also structural. It's got to do with the fact that the biggest demander of many of those mineral commodities, industrial minerals in particular, the People's Republic of China, is changing its growth strategy, is moving up the value chain, is emphasizing consumption in its own economy and moving into a more diversified services economy, 
and that that is actually a much less mineral commodity intensive growth path than the previous growth path uh, that it was on. And there's nobody around it, and by the looks of it, uh, that's going to jump in and fill the, the gap uh, in, in the same way. Um, in South Africa, if you look at the current iteration of our industrial policy action plan, you'll see there they, they say, well, the obvious need in, uh, of South Africa is that we need to promote higher levels of inclusive economic growth. I want to emphasize the inclusive part of it, but high levels of growth. And the analysis that is uh, coming out of the IPAP is saying, well, if we look back uh, over the last, 80, well, over the 84 quarters that preceded the end of last year, that takes us into 1993, we had growth of 5% uh, in only 16 of them, 16 of the 84 quarters. And what was it that growth, drove the growth during those periods? Well, it was consumption and it was the mineral commodity super cycle. With the balance of trade as it is, we can't uh, any longer expect to, to, to live on uh, a, a, a consumption-driven growth path and nor can we rely any longer, as I've already made the point, on a commodity super cycle. So what we've got to do, we've got to move up the value chain. And this corresponds with all sorts of other pieces of research or data that we can just mention. Um, I've quoted this one, I mean, maybe many of you have heard this one before, but I think it just tells the story. Uh, it's a, a study by KPMG, which is called Africa Risen, which was uh, done last year, presented last year. And they said that Africa produces and exports coffee uh, which receives uh, six billion rand of value, uh, six billion dollars rather, uh, US dollars of value. But that coffee is uh, converted into products, is blended, is packaged, is whatever else they do to it, uh, outside of the borders of the African continent that fetch a hundred billion dollars. In other words, six billion of the hundred billion dollar value chain only is captured by the production and export of raw uh, coffee beans. And another example they gave is that Italy earns more from the production and uh, export of uh, gold jewellery than South Africa does from the production and export of gold. I think these are all examples that the real value in global value chains is not uh, to be found in the primary production uh, stage of the value chains. In other words, the worst place to be integrated into global value chains is as a producer and exporter of primary products and as an importer of finished goods. Even if we were to say that many jobs were to be created in service sectors, I think there's enough evidence around now that is telling us that those service sectors will be more secure and also of a higher quality if they are part of an economy whose productive base is diversifying and moving up the value chain rather than if they are simply footloose like Cyprus banks, for example, were. So I think that um, all of these are factors which lead the continent to say that the next phase of African growth has got to be uh, driven by industrial development, diversification, moving up the value chain, and inserting the continent into a different place in the global division of labor. And I think that that is um, something which uh, is the product of big debates. We were very active in those debates as South Africa. Big debates, but now there is a consensus around some of this, and many of the regional integration programs are addressing themselves to this, uh, what I think is increasingly seen as an imperative of promoting uh, industrialization on the continent. If you look again at um, the situation of South Africa and some of the um, industrial development drivers which we identify in our IPAP, you will see a couple of things. First of all, we have a consistent trade surplus in the African continent and our exports to the African continent have a higher proportion of value-added products than our exports elsewhere. Of course, it is our objective uh, in uh, all of our external trade relations to try to promote value-added exports. Wherever we are, we try to promote more value-added exports, but 
The fact of the matter is, of course, and I think for good historic reasons, it's uh, well understood that the African continent is where we have um, a, a significant uh, presence in our trade basket of uh, value-added exports. <clears throat> if we look at our uh, drivers, a number of them, I think, speak directly to the uh, continued uh, processes on the, in the region, uh, where we see, for example, that among the drivers are infrastructure-driven industrialization, where I think that the, uh, we're looking, of course, to use our own domestic infrastructure program and some of the localization measures that go along with that, uh, to drive a, uh, a reindustrialization, particularly focusing on capital goods, transport equipment uh, uh, sectors. But also I think we, we, we're seeing that those uh, firms must also become part of a continental process as well, where industrial, I mean, sorry, infrastructure development programs uh, will also take place and provide uh, opportunities there. Mineral beneficiation. I think that these are uh, very, very hard nuts to crack, but I think that we can see that if we act together as a region and a continent, uh, we will be able to uh, affect some of the uh, policy changes that are required to support mineral beneficiation more easily than if we just act uh, as individual countries. And then the other one is uh, the one which is the focus of attention here, uh, is uh, regional value chains. How can we develop regional value chains that support industrialization, not just in South Africa, but also uh, in the broader continent and region? And if that gives rise to growth, a new growth spurt on the continent, it will be a growth spurt that will benefit industrial development here in South Africa as well. And so I think that that is the sort of background and the perspectives uh, on regional industrialization that we support in South Africa and that we're also seeing uh, increasingly um, large numbers of other countries on the continent are also supporting. So how does this then lead uh, into the approach that we've been taking on regional integration? I think it was mentioned by uh, the speaker from UN WIDA when he said that we're not going to be seeing the SADAC Customs Union anytime soon. A few years ago, the debate on regional integration was a debate about deepening integration within existing regional communities. It was about setting time frames for SADAC to move beyond the, uh, the current uh, uh, free trade area that is in existence in SADAC into a customs union and also then into things like monetary union. That was the focus of attention to move to um, more, uh, uh, well, move further up Jacob Viner's ladder of regional integration and to see this as uh, the, uh, the focuses of attention of the debate on regional integration. Now, um, we were, as South Africa, extremely wary of those debates. We started to ask ourselves and ask some very fundamental questions. What does the movement from a free trade area to a customs union, what does this bring in terms of opportunities to promote intra-regional trade? And the answers that were coming even from the researchers that were doing the research is nothing. Because if you have a free trade area, you already have duty-free trade among yourselves. The customs union simply means you add on top of that a common external tariff. And people were telling us that there were advantages because we could lock in low tariffs uh, towards the, the world as a whole, and we would then benefit because we would somehow rather be integrated into uh, global value chains. And I think that that kind of approach to integration into global value chains was extremely simplistic uh, and didn't take account of uh, a number of uh, uh, very, very important dynamics uh, in the global economy. We have, for example, in South Africa, we have, I think, successfully managed to integrate one of our sectors into global value chains. That's the automotive sector, where we were producing essentially for a local market, and then we changed the programs uh, in the 1990s, and we've managed to integrate our productive activities into global value chains. That required 
a pretty significant and pretty costly effort by governments to achieve that. That didn't come simply on the basis of trade liberalization. We've seen other examples practically. Um, there was a company in Cape Town that was uh, an international company. It was bought by another international company. Uh, it produced um, uh, fire alarms. And uh, that company came in and said, okay, now you're part of our global value chain. We're taking all the manufacturing business elsewhere. Uh, you're going to be a depot for our products. Unfortunately, in that case, the managers uh, worked with our team and we managed to establish a, a local South African company which is producing better products than they used to produce before. But as an example, that integration into global value chain simply on the basis of a, of a trade uh, policy stance does not necessarily mean that you get industrial development of it. You can actually get uh, precisely the opposite, uh, deindustrialization. And so I think that <clears throat> we said we can't see uh, the benefits of this. We were, by the way, supposed by next year to have monetary union in SEDAC, the old Regional Indicative Strategic Development Program, RISDP. We were supposed to have had a customs union by 2010, and we were supposed to have had a monetary union by 2016. Now, I think if you just think a bit about Greece in a monetary union with a currency which is uh, set by a, a stronger economy, Apart from all the debt issues that Greece is facing, the country has faced massive deindustrialization. Uh, is that uh, uh, a model uh, that we want to, to bring in? And isn't the whole approach, I think this is what we ended up saying, isn't the whole approach shaped by a view that in Europe or elsewhere they have something like this and that uh, somehow or other we think that we are more integrated if we prioritize institutional arrangements of a high ambition of this sort over developments on the ground. And I think that's the real issue. Because even if you go back to the work of Jacob Viner, when he talked about embarking on regional integration, he argued that regional integration made sense where you had high levels of complementarity, where one country produced what the other country needed and vice versa. And that was the, the case in Europe, where you had industrialized countries. In Africa, many of the barriers to intra-regional trade are not actually to be found uh, in the fact that we've got uh, high customs duties between ourselves, but rather they're to be found in the, quite, the, the, the nature of the productive sectors, where we're not producing uh, goods that find uh, markets in each other's countries, because we are producers and exporters of copper, and producers and exporters of iron ore, and we don't have much to trade with each other if that's our, our, uh, our, our place in the, in the global division of labor. And so the issues are actually much more about promoting real economy diversification and addressing some of the other serious concrete barriers to inter-regional trade, which are to be found in things like inadequate infrastructure, which doesn't connect us up one to another, but rather connects the mine to the port, uh, and, uh, and then even if you want to go into things like soft infrastructure, uh, border arrangements and other regulations which are often uh, more important uh, than tariffs. And I think that out of this, <clears throat> and perhaps without it being uh, theorized at the beginning, but I think that we can theorize it in this way now, I think that what we have come to the conclusion, uh, most of us, and this is the, the consensus and this is driving the current programs, is that at this moment in time, at the least, what we need is not to deepen regional integration within existing regional communities, but actually we need to broaden regional integration at FTA level across our existing regional communities, but within a framework which is developmental. In other words, we need a development integration approach. And I think that, again, there's a number of very, very practical reasons why this is the case. And again, I think they've probably got to do with the state of the world economy and where we find ourselves uh, right now. Again, let's take China. Let's take India. Where are they seeking to drive the next phase of their industrialization and economic diversification? Well, it's at the very least, it's walking on two legs. 
the domestic market is one of the important legs that they are now emphasizing to a greater degree than before. The idea that we could all go out and flood the EU and the US with manufactured goods and that that would be the driver of industrial development, even if that existed at some earlier phase, and I think there's a question mark over that, it certainly doesn't exist now. Because the United States, Europe, all the countries uh, that are around there are themselves trying to reindustrialize, and they are becoming much less receptive to large influxes of new uh, goods coming from uh, other parts of the world. Um, and in fact, the, the state of their economies is not such that there is a growing uh, demand uh, for, uh, for new products coming from, uh, from elsewhere. And the fact of the matter is, though, that those countries, emerging markets, which are trying to walk on two legs, have all got large populations and a large domestic market, not a small domestic market. And so I think here comes the, the challenge for Africa. Colonialism divided us into 54 different countries. None of us, certainly not South Africa, I would argue not even Nigeria, has got a domestic market which is sizable enough to support industrial development and diversification. But if we start looking across our countries, if we start looking beyond our regions, in fact, if we start looking beyond SADAC, and we start looking at SADAC, Comesa, and the East African community, we start to hit the numbers that do make sense at that level. We start to talk about 500 to 600 million people. We start to talk about uh, something like a combined GDP of over a trillion uh, US dollars. If we look at the African continent as a whole, we're talking two billion. We're talking, uh, sorry, we're talking two trillion uh, US dollars. We're talking a population uh, which, is, which is about uh, one and a half billion people. We start to hit the numbers that do provide uh, the basis uh, for uh, supporting uh, regional um, uh, development and economic diversification. And so I think that we're coming up, uh, perhaps uh, it is that uh, we've been walking across the, uh, the stepping stones one by one, and there have been accidental things, and I think they were things like the fact that we had overlapping memberships in SADC and Comesi in particular, that drove us into this project. But I think that in the end of the day, uh, the, the project and the definition of the project is the right way to go, broadening integration within a developmental uh, a paradigm. And so where are we at in uh, this process? And, and where are we at uh, in the continent? <clears throat> well, I think that the, the first thing to say is that it doesn't, of course, mean that there is no trade integration component. There is a trade integration component. We have to have an FTA in place. We have to have an FTA in place, not least because all of us in different regions are negotiating something like this with the European Union. And if we don't, we will be trading with each other on worse terms than the European Union. That can't be the basis of developing regional value chains. So we do need a, uh, an FTA in place. So we've been uh, on this journey uh, for some time now. We basically said, and I think uh, pragmatically so, that we're not going to try to reopen the trade arrangements that exist within each regional community. So we're not going to reopen the SADAC trade protocol. We're going to focus instead on negotiations with countries or groups of countries with which uh, each of us do not have any kind of uh, trade preference. So we will, uh, we will move across uh, the, uh, the, the tripartite area like that. We had a summit uh, in Sharm El Sheikh. I was there. Uh, uh, last month, uh, and this summit adopted the legal agreement uh, for uh, the establishment of, the, uh, of the, uh, the tripartite FTA, and it also set a time frame of one year to conclude the outstanding, which actually is the majority, of the tariff schedule negotiations that have been started in one form or another. In our case, we have already exchanged offers and had a few rounds of negotiations with the East African community. When I say us, it's SARCO. We have to work as the Southern African Customs Union. 
a Saku East African community, that negotiation has started. We are pretty close to, uh, to, to finalizing our offer, which we will submit to Egypt. Uh, that does leave a few. Um, there's, quite, there's quite a few, actually. There's Egypt, there's uh, Ethiopia, there's Djibouti, there's Sudan. Uh, there's quite a number of others. But I think the two main ones uh, are on track, and I think we can, uh, as uh, certainly in our uh, uh, outstanding negotiation, we can actually conclude that uh, by uh, the end of the year. But um, the approach is not just uh, FTA negotiations. The approach is also supposed to be infrastructure development. I think Donald Kabaruk uh, uh, said a little while ago that uh, the infrastructure deficit on the African continent was costing the continent the equivalent of 2% growth. There is an infrastructure deficit which is not being covered by existing funding mechanisms. The uh, um, infrastructure project that goes along with the TFTA is the North-South Corridor. Uh, some progress, but also still some challenges to build the infrastructure that's at stake. One of the reasons why we have been so keen on the BRICS New Development Bank, which is now up and running, uh, is that, uh, and why we've, the, the first uh, regional office will be established here in South Africa, is because we see that there is an opportunity to tap into other funds, which can, among other things, support uh, regional uh, infrastructure development across the African continent and provide greater connectivity uh, between our countries. The industrial development pillar, however, is very, very behind at the tripartite level. What we did though, do, though, was at the SADAC level, there was a special conference that took place about a month or so ago of SADAC, which was entirely devoted to the development of the SADAC industrial development strategy. That strategy, I don't know if you've seen it, I think it's worth looking at, uh, is a piece of work which I, I think we can say is a strategy document. I often compare it to our own national industrial policy framework. It co covers much of the same sort of ground. It indicates the domain of potential actions which can be taken to support industrial development with a big focus and a big expectation on regional value chains. And the other critical issue that I think we're all going to have to confront is the question of financing. Because the observation is made, which was the same observation we made when we introduced the first iteration of our current industrial policy action plans, is that private credit extension does not go to support uh, productive investment. By and large, it goes to support consumption-driven activities. And uh, the question of the role of development finance institutions and what uh, these might mean in terms of regional indu industrial development, these are going to be massive, massive challenges as we move uh, further forward. At the level of the continent, let's just say, um, of course the AU had reached the obvious conclusion from the tripartite process, and of course it is a really critical question for us as well, what about the rest of the continent? What about West Africa? What about the rest of North Africa? Because Egypt and Libya are part of the tripartite. What about the rest of North Africa and of West Africa? And so the conclusion was reached that, well, we need to move towards a continental FTA, which is a journey that we also support. The negotiations for that were opened at the AU summit that was held here in, in Johannesburg, but the time frame let me just put it this way, as diplomatically as I can, is extremely ambitious. Uh, the negotiations are supposed to be concluded by 2017, uh, and uh, that uh, is uh, uh, including also uh, a trade in services uh, component, which in the tripartite is, uh, is put into phase two, uh, but in phase one, the, f the current phase of negotiations at the continental level is supposed to include a trading services uh, component uh, as well. So um, let me say that uh, um, I think that's a sort of a description of where these processes are at uh, at the moment. Let me conclude with a, with a, with a few remarks about uh, uh, some of the, of the challenges. I think first of all, uh, the issue that you all here to talk about, regional value chains, is one of the critical ones. 
We've identified, I think, in very, very broad conceptual terms that there are things called regional value chains that can inc include uh, manufacturing which involves uh, uh, inputs from different parts uh, of uh, the region or the continent. And that uh, the identification and development of these is a critical component of uh, African industrialization. And I think that is, uh, that is one of the challenges. And I think that actually getting down and dirty and really understanding and, and analyzing what are these regional value chains. Sometimes people talk about, well, uh, auto component manufacturing can go to other countries and uh, some of us like South Africa can be uh, the, the automotive manufacturers and things like that. Well, I think that, uh, you know, and there is a bit of migration that takes place here and there, uh, but uh, how um, and what uh, should we be doing to, to support an inclusive uh, set of uh, industrial activities? Because I think the temptation of some countries is not to see uh, the, uh, the, the regional value chain as the driver of industrial development, but the domestic market. And that, that can lead to uh, people saying, well, uh, we, we didn't have the industrial pillar in place when we had the uh, SADAC trade protocol, and therefore uh, there's no need for us to respect the SADAC trade protocol. And I think that what that would mean in practice would mean uh, under, undermining uh, the, uh, a tool that could be in place that could support uh, the emergence and development uh, of, uh, of regional value chains. For South Africa, uh, we have, of course, uh, supermarkets and uh, exporters in all countries with a high proportion uh, of uh, South African products on sale. I think that this model of um, us is going to have to change we're going to have to move into a different spot uh, in uh, regional value chains. And here I think there's a couple of examples that um, I think are telling us the way, uh, practical examples. We are, for example, or we were, and I think this will continue under the new administration, but we were involved in very earnest engagements uh, with Nigeria about the Nigerian uh, automotive uh, program. Uh, we were providing them with quite a bit of technical input into the design of their program. And at the same time, I think we're at the point where we are looking for uh, South African companies to be suppliers into the Nigerian market of components that will be used in semi-knockdown kit assembly and also some of the finished uh, built-up units uh, that would enter under the, uh, the program. That's the sort of thing that I think we're talking about. So as Nigeria begins to manufacture vehicles, maybe some of those will find their way in, into South Africa as well. I think those are the, that's the kind of model that we're looking at as well. Secondly, another practical example, I had the opportunity to uh, attend the opening of an investment by a consortium including Score Metals. Uh, they had established a plant uh, to manufacture grinding material for the West African mining industry in Accra in Ghana. Uh, and now, before that, this grinding material was imported from South Africa. Uh, now there's a plant there, manufacture that, but the components into that will come from South Africa. So I think that these are the sort of signs on the wall, if you like, that we're going to find, have to find ourselves occupying a somewhat different place uh, in, uh, in these uh, value chains, we're going to have to move up. What is that location for South Africa? What is the location for other countries? How do we promote an inclusive industrialization based on regional value chains? And perhaps resist the temptation with very small markets to say, well, uh, this is going to be it. The national market's going to be the driver uh, to help with uh, uh, the regional integration uh, and so on and so forth. I think that's going to be one of the very, very critical issues. The other one I, I, I was saying was um, uh, the question of finance, investment and finance. Now, I think that doesn't all come from DFIs. Uh, we can be promoting uh, some uh, foreign investment in uh, industrial activities. Um, I think that uh, uh, sometimes we have to tell people in this country that the investment pipeline into manufacturing despite what may be happening in mining or uh, in terms of the uh, portfolio investments, is actually holding up reasonably well because quite a number of companies are making the, the, the bet that the regional market will integrate, 
that South Africa is, cr is critical in the uh, uh, industrial uh, development of the African continent and that uh, this is a, a place that uh, they need to invest in, in productive manufacturing uh, activity. We've seen this in a number of uh, different uh, uh, sectors uh, that this is, this is taking place. But how do we address, I think, the, the question of industrial financing? That, you think, is a, is, 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 is a very, very critical question. So let me then just uh, conclude uh, with um, where I, I started. I think that the stage we are in, the period that we find ourselves in, is one where a very significant research input is required. In the case of SADAC, I said the, the strategy is a, a strategy which is at the level of uh, identifying the potential domain of actions that can be taken to support industrial development across SADAC. The mandate that was given to the Secretariat was that this must be turned into an action plan that must be tabled for adoption next year. So uh, the clock is ticking uh, and um, the identification in particular of regional value chains and how we promote some kind of inclusive involvement in regional value chains is I think uh, critically important. And the last point I'd make is that we then face, I think, uh, I'm going next week to a discussion about the WTO. How do we defend the policy space to develop and support regional value chains against what I think will be uh, a series of demands for industrial tariff lowering with the ostensible benefit that we will have access to markets that are very distant from us and where the benefit I think is more hypothetical but the risk is that the global that the regional value chains will be undermined by the import of finished products coming from outside of the region so I think that's the uh, the last point I would make so um, welcome the uh, the focus of this tips forum uh, wish you well and look forward to receiving a report of uh, the outcomes and uh, I hope that you have uh, a good uh, and uh, valuable conference. And by the way, you told me that you had a very hot debate on the bits. You might want to look and see because the new investment bill uh, will be tabled in Parliament in the very near future. It's already gone through Cabinet. Thank you very much.